Well, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Doing well? I'm doing well, too. And it, re it really is a special day for me today. Um, among other things, whoops, not that. <laughs> not that. Uh, it's my birthday. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's true. Absolutely true. Yes, today I am 65 years old. Yeah, that's kind of cool, isn't it? No, 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 no. <laughs> You'll use up my 10 minutes. Anyway, you know, I started to worry about something because I've heard the word curmudgeon used a lot for people in my age bracket, and now that I'm 65. So I looked, actually, I didn't look it up. I asked Siri this morning to look it up for me. And uh, so what curmudgeon is, according to Siri, is a crusty, irascible, cantankerous old person full of stubborn ideas. <laughs> Some of that applies to me but not all of it. But I'm gonna be a little bit, of, uh, a little bit cantankerous today because um, I want us to consider what's going on in education today or specifically <laughs> what we can do about it. Look familiar? I mean, we've all seen this. Anyone who's taught has been seeing more and more of this. Students, you've been experiencing it yourselves. So what brings this kind of behavior about? Well, there have been a number of articles and here's a recent <laughs> one that tells us what is wrong in the classroom. It's the use of PowerPoint slides. But you know what? PowerPoint, or for that matter, Apple Keynote, uh, these are not bad entities in and of themselves. They're great apps, but they're apps that are often misapplied or misused. And here's the reason why. This is what students are exposed to hour after hour in the classroom. Nothing but a bunch of bullet text. And let's just bring those bullets right in Call a spade a spade. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, Melissa Marshall's excellent TED Global Talk of June uh, 2012. Um, so I borrowed this from her. It's not original to me. But guys, what do bullets do? Bullets kill. Bullets absolutely kill. And they will kill your presentation. They will annihilate your students. They will totally disengage them from wanting to learn or even be interested in what it is you have to say. So we find ourselves at a crossroads. Are we going to take the route of, multi, of uh, bullet points, rather, and where we're just going to continue to turn our students into mindless zombies, dictation-taking machines? Or are we going to take an alternate route of multimedia and see if we can get our students engaged in what it is we have to say? Well, I'm going to advocate that we do the latter. And I'd love to show you three examples of uh, how I actually try to make this happen in my own classes. My first example is something called the framing effect. Framing, how we frame an argument, how we frame a question, how we pose a question can greatly affect the kind of response that you can get back as a result of that. So I don't use a textbook in my class. So what I do is I go to scientific journals find something that relates to a point that I want to make in class, and then I put it into Keynote as bullet points. But I would never, ever show something like this in class. It's only an outline for me. So what I then do is go from the bullet points to Keynote for presentation. So the following is what my students see when I talk about the framing effect. There's an area of the brain that's called the amygdala. It is hugely involved in a variety of emotions, emotional expression, the processing of emotions, things like that. OK, with that in mind, there's a glass of liquid. Let me ask you, how many think this glass is half empty? <laughs> One. How many think it's half full? Oh, yeah. Optimists. How many think it's a stupid question? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a ridiculous question. But you know what? If you were grappling with whether you should answer half empty or half full, you, in fact, were exhibiting this framing effect. And this is associated with a bit of an emotional response, just enough such that you're going to see more activity, guess where, in your amygdala. So this study asked questions like this of people while they were undergoing fMRI brain scans, OK? So let me ask you this. Two packages of ground beef. They're identical, 
except for the labels. One says 80% beef, and the other one says 20% fat. Which do you want? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to ask my two brothers. Whoa, 80% beef versus 20% fat. Well, I don't like a lot of fat, so I'm definitely going to take the 80% beef. Yeah, but dude, 80% beef, 20% fat, they're exactly the same thing. There is no choice here. Give me whichever you want. Okay, so brother over on the left is trying to grapple. 80% beef, 20% fat, likes the 80% beef, gonna go with that. Brother on the right says it's a stupid question. Where are we gonna see that increased amygdala activity? Over in that guy, because he's got a little bit of a more emotional reaction to the way that question was framed. And that's how I present the framing effect. My second example deals with drugs, and specifically how drugs work in the brain on neurotransmitters. So I could do that. It's not a lot of bulleted text after all, but for me it's too much. So I don't do that. That's my guideline. Here's what my students see. So a neurotransmitter is found inside the brain, and it'll come across from one neuron to the next, lock into a receptor site, causing it to fire, getting the message across, all is right with the world. An agonist is a drug that mimics the action of a neurotransmitter. Does exactly the same thing. But an antagonist blocks the action of a neurotransmitter so that it cannot lock into the receptor site. And now you have an interruption in communication in the brain. That's generally not a good thing. So with that in mind, here's a neurotransmitter. It's called glutamate. It's found throughout the brain. It's particularly abundant in the hippocampus, an important structure involved in learning and memory, as well as stress and other things as well. So if everything is going according to plan, we have glutamate that's going to come across from one neuron, lock into a very special receptor site in the next neuron called an NMDA receptor. And it's going to look something like this. Gets the message across, learning and memory will happen, all other things being equal. But, but, what if you've been drinking alcohol? Alcohol's a drug. It's actually an antagonist to glutamate. It's going to block that receptor site <laughs> so that when glutamate tries to come across and do its job, Ain't nothing going to happen. And now learning, memory goes right down the drain, <laughs> which is bad if you're a student. One way to remember this, think about that receptor, the NMDA receptor. What's NMDA stand for? Well, it stands for some long chemical term. For me, it stands for no memory drinking alcohol. <laughs> and that's how I present that. Well, my final example relates to a personal experience of mine. I was asked to be a plenary speaker at a rather prestigious honor society. I was really nervous about that, about as nervous as I am with Ted, actually. <laughs> uh, this was different, nervous for a different reason. I mean, my GPA as an undergraduate was just all over the place. Uh, it, it settled down into an OK level, uh, but there was no way that I was an honor student. And so here I am giving a plenary talk at this honor society. I'm trying to think, oh my gosh, how am I going to start this? So I started it by doing the following. Thank you for invi inviting me. I really feel like a, a fish out of water uh, talking to this particular group. And I'd like to, to show you why I feel that way. Uh, those of you that are familiar with uh, Sam Cooke, we've heard from Sam Cooke's uh, music earlier today, Ted. Uh, excellent musician, excellent songwriter, singer. Uh, Sam Cooke wrote a song called What a Wonderful World It Would Be. And if you remember the lyrics to, of that song, it had something to do with how he wasn't particularly good at various topics in school. Um, but it didn't matter to him, because as long as he had his girlfriend, then the world is great, everything is fine, doesn't matter that I don't know all these other things. So I put together this slide. So like Sam Cooke, whoops, whoa. Like Sam Cooke, I too don't know much about history or biology or science books or the French I took or geography or trigonometry or algebra. I sure don't know what a slide rule is for. <laughs> it's sad because I really don't. <laughs> I really don't. 
And the reason I'm showing you this example is, in fact, that it took me four hours to produce what amounts to 14 seconds of screen time. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Get a life! <laughs> right? But you know what? It did take an awful lot of planning to do this, figure, figure out what I want to say, how I want to say it, locate the media, stand in front of that green screen with the fish. I was not in the aquarium with the fish. I was a fish out of water, for God's sakes. So putting it all together, do all of the editing, re-record, re-record till I got the timing right, do a lot of post-production. Four hours later, my wife walks in and wants her dinner. And I'm supposed to be cooking dinner, and I'm cooking that instead. But you know what? Was it time well spent? You know, I, I really think it was, and I felt vindicated because I remembered what George Lucas said in a commentary track way back in the old days when we had laser discs. This is the ancestor of DVDs, guys. Many of you don't even know what a laser disc is, but they had director tracks. He was talking about a scene from outer space that was a very important scene. It was one of these big battles and lots of spaceships coming from all directions and shooting one another. He said, that it took six months to produce what amounted to four seconds of screen time. Wow, was it time well spent? Yeah. He managed to, in those four seconds, transport us to worlds we had never seen before and worlds that we would probably not want to see, but that we were able to see and be drawn in and be engaged by them, engagement. And that is where I'm heading with all this. Do we have to say death by PowerPoint, death by keynote? No, the problem is not with the software, it's what we do with it. So my take home message then is that we really need to think about ways of getting our students engaged. Engagement is key to unlocking the door to education. Once we grab their attention, once we get them engaged, that door's gonna come flying open or get stuck. <laughs> but you know what? I really think it is time well spent, and um, it's, it's worth the investment. So thank you all so very much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>